My dad had two core values. One was to treasure relationships, especially family. And the second was to be an agent for change and make a major difference in the world. So I was hardwired from being a young boy to know that my mission was to visualize and see things that didn't exist and to respond to problems. He had a corollary, and that was when you look for someone to solve a problem in the world, when you look for the inchoate they or them or that institution, you can wait forever. He would say, son, when it comes time to address problems in the world and help people who can't help themselves, the they is you, the they is me. So I went up to Berkeley in the late 60s and uh, became student body president when Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin were playing music and there was long hair and alternative substances and alternative dress. Um, and we fought semester after semester against the war in Vietnam and we fought for all sorts of changes. Now the governor at that time was a little known figure named Ronald Reagan. And he and I had classic battles uh, over time. So I was looking for a way to make whatever craft I was in speak to the fundamental underlying values and be able to make a difference in the world. I was a dorm counselor in an undergraduate dorm, and they moved the freshman football team into the dorm, and one of those students was Steve Bartkowski. He became the first player picked in the 1975 draft and asked me to represent him. So there I was, brimming with legal experience, uh, and I had the first pick in the draft. We got lucky, we got the largest rookie contract in NFL history, it eclipsed Joe Namath and O.J. Simpson, and we flew from Berkeley to Atlanta. So we get into the airport in Atlanta, and there are Klee lights flashing in the sky like for a movie premiere. A huge crowd's pressed up against a police line, and the first thing we heard was, we interrupt the Johnny Carson show to bring you a special news bulletin. Steve Bartkowski and Lee Steinberg have just arrived at the Atlanta airport. We switch you live for an in-depth interview. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at him probably the way that Dorothy looked at Toto when they got to Munchkin land. And I said, Steve, I guess we're not in Berkeley anymore. But I had an epiphany because I saw the way that athletes were the celebrities, athletes were the movie stars, and thought, how can I make this craft speak to fundamental values and make it different? And I thought if, that if athletes would go back to the high school community that helped shape them, the collegiate community and the professional community, and set up programs to enhance the qualities there, they could be known for the quality of their character. So I made it a practice not to take any clients who weren't interested in that. Because you see, athletes can trigger imitative behavior. They can permeate the perceptual screen that people put up against authority figures, principals, police, parents, and make a, a real impact. So I thought, um, Let's have them do this. And so we started with about 120 high school scholarship funds or donations to churches or donations to a, a boys club. Then we moved to the collegiate community and said, this community shaped you. We want to root you back into it. And we had scholarship funds. So a Troy Aikman or an Eric Karos set up a full-time endowed scholarship at UCLA. At the professional level, I challenge these athletes to find something in their own life that they would like to tackle. For uh, Rolf Benerska, who was a place kicker for the Chargers, it was endangered species. So we set up a program that got the leading political figures, business leaders, and community figures all on a board that helped propel his program. So we started it off, he was a field goal kicker, by having him kick a field goal off the uh, uh, flipper of a sea lion. And the next year we had him kick one off a flipper, well, whatever the appendage is for an elephant, and, that's, and he kicked it off that one. And we called the program Kicks for Critters. 
For every dollar that Bernershka gave to the Fund for Endangered Species at the San Diego Zoo, he would give $100. But there were posters and pledge cards all throughout the city. So you walked into a Burger King poster pledge card. A little kid could give a dollar for field goal. They actually organized cans for critters. A big businessman, $1,000. Burger King uh, into the biggest bank. These proliferated. And we were able to raise over $10 million for endangered species. And that research actually saved species. So it's a little daunting to think that one young man could do that. For work done a running back, it was Homes for the Holidays, where we took single mothers and moved them into the first home that they would ever own by making the down payment, and then outfitted it from uh, Home Depot. So these programs have spread across the country, raising millions of dollars in consciousness, and have changed attitudes about the ability to make a difference in life and make a difference in the world. So when we had Lennox Lewis, the heavyweight boxing champion, cut a public service announcement that said, real men don't hit women, it could do more to change the thought process in rebellious adolescents towards domestic violence than a thousand authority figures could do. Or when I had Oscar De La Hoya and Steve Young cut a PSA that said, prejudice is foul play, it could make uh, the same sort of impact. I had a scare when Oklahoma City came and I saw nascent skinheads and racists starting to move in this country and I thought there's the they but who's doing anything about it? So I went to the Anti-Defamation League and set up a program where we trained 30 people, young doctors, lawyers, businessmen in each of the biggest cities, the 30 biggest cities across the country, in how to intervene in crisis situations, how to do intelligence work uh, for police departments, how to go into school systems and promote concepts that enhanced an appreciation for the cultural heritage and operated against prejudice. So the first year I had Colin Powell as the speaker and the next year I had William Webster head of the FBI. And so 5,000 of these people were trained. So I can go to sleep at night feeling a little better that this is our watch. This is our time. I couldn't do anything about the Holocaust. I couldn't cure the Civil Rights Movement. I was too young. But I sure can make sure that this country and environment is safe for all people and a place of nurturing support. Problems came up in, in uh, football like um, the whole issue of concussions. There was a night when Troy Aikman suffered a concussion. The Dallas Cowboys beat the San Francisco 49ers. So I went to visit him. The city's awash in celebration. There's horns honking. This is Dallas now. The horns honking and people are going absolutely crazy. And I visit Troy in a darkened hospital room. And he looked at me confused and he said, Lee, where am I? I said, well, you're in the hospital. Why am I here? Because you suffered a concussion. What is, uh, did I play today? Yes, you played. Did I play well? You threw multiple touchdown passes. And what does it mean? It means you're going to the Super Bowl. And his face brightened. Five minutes passed, and he looked at me and said, Lee, why am I here? Where am I? and went through the same sequence of questions. Ten minutes passed and he did it all over again. And I became terrified how tender the bond is between sentient consciousness and dementia. And then I thought, I can't continue representing half the starting quarterbacks in the NFL and 60 first round draft picks and put them out into a sport that I know is going to break down every joint of their body and moreover, is going to cause long-term mental uh, and emotional problems. And what makes concussion different than any other injury is the fact that it affects the brain, it affects consciousness, it affects identity. So we started to hold uh, concussion conferences and we finally found out from neurologists across the country that three or more occasion an exponentially higher rate in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, premature 
senility and uh, dementia, and four times the rate of depression. So I've been on a campaign to try to change that culture and to, to find ways to raise awareness. And those of you who have kids, um, just remember that baseline testing is the antidote. And for kids, it takes three times as long to recover as an adolescent from a, a concussion. I looked around and I saw, thought, we're going to be the first generation in the history of this country to hand down a lower quality of life to our kids, a degraded quality of life, because of the specter of climate change. So what do we do? Well, how could I use sports? So we set up a concept called the Sporting Green Alliance, where we took sustainable technology in wind, solar, water, recycling, resurfacing, and put it in a bundle and have taken it to teams at the um, pro, college, and high school level to incorporate it into their energy grid, to drop carbon emissions and energy costs, and to um, try to turn them into energy providers so they can actually sell energy back to the grid, and to turn those venues into educational platforms. So the millions of fans that come to games can see a waterless urinal, can see a solar panel, and the first time they can um, think about how to incorporate that into their own homes and businesses. So the point is to see the world as it is and think about how you can innovate, how you can change. So I guess I can't leave without telling you that a film director called Cameron Crowe called me up back in 1993 and said he wanted to do a film based on a, a character who was a sports agent. So he followed me everywhere. We went to the NFL draft. In 1993, we went to uh, the league meetings. He came to Super Bowls. He came everywhere. Um, and he, I told him stories, lots and lots of stories. And he then wrote a script that became Jerry Maguire. And uh, there was a time we were out in Palm Springs, and it was a league meeting, so we were looking very hard for a team for a player named Tim McDonald. Tim goes upstairs in his room in between this search, and Cameron is sitting there with him, the director. And Moneyline was on in the background with Lou Dobbs. So Cameron said to Tim, well, let me ask you, uh, what are you looking for in this process? What are you looking for for a team? And Tim said, well, I'm looking for a team to show me some respect. I'm looking for a team to, to show me a winning victory. I'm looking for a team to, to show me a great facility. And Cameron went off and wrote the line, show me the money. Um, <laughs> After that, I worked on a film with a, a very different director, Oliver Stone, uh, which was called Any Given Sunday. And um, so my job was to make sure that the willing suspension of disbelief that's so necessary to keep you in the plot not get shattered. We took Cuba Gooding Jr. on Jerry Maguire down to the Super Bowl and uh, made him pretend he was a wide receiver for weeks and weeks and weeks. I challenge you today to find something that is a passion or a cause for you, whether it's good parenting, whether it's changing the way that business goes, whether it's refuting situational ethics, and know that you can make a difference. You can make change because you're part of the group that would rather light candles than curse the darkness and that glow will fill the world. Thank you.